welcome. I am so glad that you're here today. My name is Tony Shuda, and I'm known as the parent coach who gets results. And I've been helping children and families now for 19 years, first as a psychologist, and now in the last nine years as a parent coach. So what I try to do as a parent coach is help parents like yourself solve everyday parenting challenges. Like, my child won't listen the first time, maybe my discipline isn't as positive as I would like or effective as I would like, maybe I'm yelling a little bit or don't know quite how to handle my child's anger, you know, when I curb back talk, get chores and homework, them, those, those really everyday challenges that we parents face. And so I help parents by one-on-one -on -one private parent coaching, I have group programs, and I have a number of free resources too. So I'll, I'll just pass uh, this one in case you want any of my free resources. Uh, you can sign up for those. I'll start it this way and then that way. And then um, one a really neat thing that I did along the way was I had a parenting radio show and uh, interviewed some of the top parenting experts in the U.S. And I put some of my interviews together in a book that just came out two weeks ago called 20 Great Ways to Raise Great Kids. And so I took 20 of my favorite interviews and had them transcribed and then edited them down so that you can get the essence of uh, what a particular expert is recommending in 15 pages. You don't necessarily have to read you know, 20 different books to get 20 great ways to raise great kids. So um, I'm very excited about that. And, and I'll just mention too, any profits made from this, I'm donating to help prevent child abuse. So um, I won't make a dime off of this, but, um, but very excited. When I did the show, there was just so much great information to share, and I thought I can't just let that all evaporate you know, somewhere in the airwaves. So, so that's available. And the talk that I'm giving today with you is really based upon findings from my book. So again, I'm just delighted to share them with you today. So I, I want to begin really by asking you, are you parenting more in the moment with perhaps a little more impulsive or knee-jerk reactions? You know, because we're all so busy and juggling so many different demands. Or are you really parenting with a strategic plan? Every day are you making decisions that you've thought about before and really um, trying to kind of lay those railroad tracks deep on the values that you want your kids to have and the skill set that they want, you want them to have. So uh, let me share a little story about a uh, mom that I worked with. And it was the very first parent coaching client I had nine years ago. And I'll call her Susan. And Susan's five-year-old was having a lot of tantrums. And uh, she would, he, the child was having them at home, but then started having these spillover tantrums out at Target and Cub and different places because the child would want something and mom would say no. And then the child would have a hissy fit on the floor, crying and screaming. And you know, when those tantrums started to spill out into public, she was like, oh, this is getting embarrassing. I feel a little weird about this, you know. And so she wanted to get some help. And so when I talked to her about it, I said, well, what's holding you back from saying no and disciplining your child? And, and she said, you know, I'm a working parent. I come home. I only have a little bit of time with my child. I don't want to be the bad cop. I just want to have fun with my child. And, you know, we can all understand, and, you know, if, if you do work outside the home or even in, my goodness, there's just a little bit of time each evening to spend with your child. So I said, okay. Well, let's look at this. You know, if you give your child basically everything that he wants, and he'll have a hissy fit until he gets it, what do you guys think that child is learning? It works. It works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To be a manipulator, absolutely. Right. And so I asked her, well, how is it that you want your child to end up? You know, kind of like our keynotes were talking about this morning, do you want your child to be resilient, responsible, respectful? Confident, persistent, right? Strong psychologically, of course we do. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I think of it kind of as building a firm foundation, brick by brick. Every decision you make is like a brick that you're putting in the foundation. So do you want a foundation that's kind of crumbling because you're not putting those bricks in place? Or do you want a really strong foundation so that your child can learn to hear the word no? Do you, you know, at work, does everybody say yes to you? Of course not. So a child needs to learn how to accept no. A child, you know, he would want something at Target, on something at Cub, and he wanted it now, right? And he'd have a fit until he got it. 
we have to learn how to delay gratification. We have to teach kids that skill set. So when you say no and you hold your no, they learn to delay that gratification. Because kids who can delay gratification, they're going to have less drug abuse, they're less likely to be overweight, less likely to have financial debt, etc. Okay, so very important skill. What was he learning about anger management? Nothing, right? <laughs> Except maybe it works, you know, it works to get what I want. And gosh, can you have a hissy fit like that <coughs> at work? Heavens no, right? You probably might get fired for it. So we need to teach our kids how to handle their anger in a constructive way. And the more we can be consistent, the more likely our child's going to learn what we call self-control. So that when you're not there, they're still going to behave and do you know, those important skills that you want them to do. Okay? So when I showed that mom how in the short term it might be easier <coughs> for her to do that, let's look at the long term. What do you want? And it was just like this light bulb went off. And um, when I work with parents, you create this definition of discipline, give them a bunch of positive tools to get there and stuff. But she posted that definition of discipline that, that had the long end game in mind. So she had the motivation on a daily basis then to, to really have that resolve to say no and follow through. Okay. <clears throat> so here are some of the findings from my book and the various experts that I interviewed, right? <clears throat> If we are inconsistent as parents, and I'll define what I mean by that uh, in, a, in a later slide here, it can lead to our kids having a higher rate of depression, obesity, and financial debt. And for heaven's sakes, we don't want that to happen to our kids. So uh, truly, I think one of the best things you can do as a parent is to become more consistent in your discipline. It's critically important that you do that, right? Okay, so right before we were talking, people were talking about, about being very busy. Right? And not having time maybe for family dinners or kind of running from activity to activity and stuff. Many of our kids are over scheduled these days. And we, frankly, are very stressed out by orchestrating all of that. And kids have higher rates of stress than ever recorded. Okay? And chronic stress leads to health problems, unhappiness in our family, and really can create havoc uh, for us. And um, I'll share a little more, I think about this later too, but American Academy of Pediatrics, 50% increase in overuse injuries to youth because we're having them play sports year round and we're having them play maybe 10, 12, 15 hours a week in that given sport. And even professional athletes take time off uh, so that their bodies can recover. Okay? And kids burning out right around the time they're 13 uh, on some given sports and then that stress we mentioned. Now, this is a big one. We're doing too much for our kids. And I'm going to share some really, frankly, startling data about how that's playing out when kids get into college. Okay? They're psychologically fragile and crumbling. And that's from a chapter in the book, Are You Accidentally Raising a Wimp? Okay? We don't mean to. It's all done out of love. And we're doing absolutely our best. And every shred of ounce, you know, energy we have is going into that. But we are really making some mistakes because a lot of kids are crumbling. Okay? Um, we're going to talk about electronics. Does anybody worry about their kids spending too much time on electronics? If you have every reason to worry, you really do. And I'll share why. And then, you know, I'll just mention at this juncture, um, you know, not only was I so concerned I wrote this book, but I'm starting what I'm calling a Raise Great Kids Community. And it's a membership site for parents. Once a month, we're going to tackle these various issues. I've identified 12 essential strategies. Next month, we're talking about overuse of electronics, how to curb. Uh, the use and get your support to do that but also I have a speaker coming in to talk about online safety because there are a lot of scary things happening too and she'll talk about the latest uh, you know how Instagram and you know all of it all changes but but anyway she'll talk about the latest safety measures for that too um, and then um, how many of you guys your kids have chores that they do on a regular basis okay about half okay so we're going to talk about that too because that's really really important okay so those are some of the findings and then here's what we're going to talk about today. Okay, four must-have strategies. <coughs> Instead of solving all our kids' problems for them, kind of rushing in to save them, we're going to talk about a couple skills that you can give your child instead. So they have the skills that they need instead of us being the heroes and swooping in to save them. Okay? 
we're going to talk about using electronics too much. And even those of you that have younger kids, I mean, this will be really good to understand why is it really important to start limiting it at an early age uh, before it gets too far gone, those of us that have teenagers and stuff. I should mention, too, I have a 17-year-old and a 13-year-old. Um, and actually, my husband's here today, too, and he's going to come in and, and just a minute, he's putting away stuff from the resource fair, so I'll embarrass him. I don't know if he's ever come to one of my talks before. So that was kind of, kind of fun to have him here. And we're going to talk about giving kids more responsibility, and particularly chores, because it's really important uh, for their future more than you know. And then there are a lot of kids that are just kind of thinking about themselves, really me-oriented. Yeah. They have a big problem with that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I've got some really fun ideas. This is actually my favorite point that I'll make today about really how to avoid that entitlement trap because it's, it's happening to a lot of kids because we're a very child-centered culture. Okay, this mom was just at the marriage um, seminar this morning, and uh, I've got some information about that too because I think it's critically important we spend time on our own relationships. So. First one we're going to talk about here, and, and I clumped a couple things together under this heading of overindulging your kids, okay? And this information comes from Jean Ilsley Clark, and there's a chapter in my book from her, and she's written her own book. And um, this is research done at the University of Minnesota out of this book, How Much is Enough? Okay, so um, let me give you an illustration. Right, there's a couple that I'm working with, and I'm going to call them. Um, and did these make it around the whole room? Did everybody get to sign in? Um, I'm going to call them Ellie and Mark. Okay. So Ellie and Mark have four kids, and they are. Okay. The ages kind of vary, uh, but basically fourth grade on down to little baby. And so they came to me for assistance because. They weren't on the same page in their discipline, so mom would respond one way, dad would respond another way. It was very confusing. They had one child that was really taking advantage of this, had a lot of kind of power in the family, a lot of tantrums and such, and so they really wanted to know how to tackle this. Well, um, one of the things that was happening in their family was that the dad wanted to be a football coach for the son. Fabulous, love it, volunteer coach, right? Well, um, as I mentioned, that what child was in fourth grade, well, it turns out that football practice was four nights a week, and so dad would rush home from work, leave at about five, and then, you know, because he was a coach, they had to clean up and this and that, and they'd get home about nine. So one, one of the kids, and then they had um, a game on the weekend too, right? So one fourth grader, dad's gone basically four nights a week, and then mom was trying to juggle the other three kids. Uh, and he shared a story about this, the toddler seeing dad come home from work at five. Dad's rushing to get out the door, and the little toddler is like going, da, 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 da. And he has to go, see ya. And then when he gets home, the baby's in bed. So it was breaking his heart. You know, he's trying to be a good dad and volunteer and be a coach, but the little one was being, you know, ignored basically by dad. The mom, in the meantime, like she was telling me one Saturday, okay, well, I took the, this is the three-year-old, right? She took the three-year-old to swimming lessons, tennis lessons, and hockey tryouts. Okay? And then there was a five-year-old and then this baby, and I won't bore you with all the details of all their lives, but do you get the picture here? Right? And um, so school started, and then the mom was sharing with me, okay, so oh, I'm so stressed, you know, it's hard to get out the door, right? And so the mom was packing the backpacks and putting them by the door, getting the shoes ready, packing the lunches, packing the snacks. And I went, whoa, wait, what are you doing? Nine-year-old, five-year-old, could they have done any of those things, do you think? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So very well-intentioned parents wanted to do so much for their kids, but what's happening, right? Doing too much for kids they can do themselves. I said, okay, wait a minute, they should get their own backpack ready. Right? They can put their shoes by the door. How about the night before they get the snack ready? Maybe there's even part of their lunch that they could pack. Right? And then you, Mom, in the morning, maybe finish the lunch if you want to. You still could have them do it, but maybe you do that. But no, 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 no. Many of us are doing too much for our kids. Okay? We give our kids too much. Their kids did not have chores. Okay? So that's another thing that we worked on. Inconsistent and discipline. As I mentioned, Mom and Dad were not on the same page, and the Mom was, um, would get real mad one day because she was very stressed, and then the next day it would be kind of like, uh, 
you know, forget it, didn't want to do it, you know. So very, they were very inconsistent. And taking too much of the family's time and resources. So we have the nine-year-old, again, gallant effort to be the coach and volunteer, but what do you think? Is that too much for a, a nine-year-old to, you know, be gone four nights a week for football practice and have a game on Saturday? That's one kid out of the four. Yeah. So things were kind of out of balance, weren't they? Exactly, in a number of different ways. So anyway, very glad, you know, they sought my services. Obviously, we worked on those items because here's what can happen, you guys, if we continue with this kind of overindulgence in those categories. Learn helplessness. Our kids don't learn how to solve problems on their own because we're swooping in and saving them and solving them for them. Okay, <coughs> they just think, oh, I don't know how to do it, so I give up. Okay, higher rates of depression. High rates of obesity. Higher, uh, poor ma money management skills because we're not teaching them that either. Right? 85% of college students will say, I wish my parents had done more. So that's going to be one of the topics in, in my raised grade kids community. Okay, overblown sense of entitlement, which we just talked about and we'll, we'll tackle today. Inability to delay their gratification. So, if you can't, you know, if it's hard to delay gratification, this has implications throughout their whole life. There's a study called the Marshmallow Study. It study kids from three all the way until they were adults, and some of you are nodding and you know about it. Exactly. They'll have higher grades, better success in uh, a job later on, lower rates of drug abuse, lower rates of teen pregnancy, you know, all of those things because I learned how you know, to wait. And so I'll give you some information about that today, too. And a lack of life skills. If you don't have chores and you go to college, how are you going to know how to do your laundry? You know, I've come home and have mom or dad do it, right? You know? How are you going to learn to make small meals? You know, how are you going to learn to clean your dorm room, etc.? We have to teach them those skills before they, they leave our care. Okay? So, here's the really alarming stuff. This is the stuff that just, you know, whoo, alarm, wake up call. 50% of college freshmen have symptoms of depression. That first semester just slays half of our kids, you guys. <clears throat> and I, you know, my kids are 17 and 13, as I mentioned, so we have some friends with kids who have gone off to college. And let me tell you, parents, I mean, I, I know four families and their kids have experienced this. <clears throat> first semester, just really can't handle it. And it's very pricey. Um, costly mistake. You know, colleges, they are all at private colleges, 40000 a year, 20000 and you don't find out as a parent until after it's all occurred, you know, if they go away to school and such. So we really need to, again, I'm really glad you're here because you're going to gain some skills to start helping your kids, even if they're just 3 or 6 or 9 or 13 right now, um, to be stronger psychologically, okay? And then over the course of college, here's kind of what we're seeing. This is a very reliable source. You know, throughout, throughout their college years, 30% report depression, 50% anxiety, 45% hopelessness, you guys. Almost half of kids, hopeless. 7% seriously considered suicide, and then their eating disorders and binge drinking. And kids, you know, if any of you went to college, oh, sure, you probably drank too much sometimes. Well, the kids with this binge drinking, are drinking to the point of passing out now. And it's like an experience that they have then. And part of the reason is they don't feel comfortable socially because of all the media they use. They don't know how to make a conversation and interact and stuff. So they swallow into the, the bottle and pass out. Okay, so it's really kind of, I mean, is anybody kind of like alarmed or shocked by this? And like, oh, I was with my nephews and they suspected about that. It's just like, you don't drink to get to the point of passing out. Oh, yeah. That's what you do. That's, yeah. that's what you do. Oh! Yeah, I know. Scary stuff. That was supposed to be an unusual or rare. If you got to that point, you were drinking yes. too much. Yes. No? That's normal. Yes. And then Lord knows if they're driving, you know, after uh, drinking to that point, too. I mean, before passing out, but, but it's scary stuff. Okay, so here's a couple quotes I love. When parents are over functioning, kids respond by under functioning. Yeah, is that good? And here's another one I love. If you water a plant too much, it dies, even if you're watering too much out of love, because every one of us are doing this out of love, right? Who, you know, you love your kids more than anything. It, it'll still die if you don't want to water it. Okay? So let's keep those images, keep those quotes in mind. Uh, we're not doing our kids a favor for doing too much for them. Okay? So here's some solutions. Uh, we need to stop rescuing them. 
And instead, I'm going to share this really fun idea Michelle Borba shared in my book called The Five Finger Problem Solving Method. Okay? So, um, this is actually uh, an example from my book, too. My friend Stephanie was uh, taking her child up to Trout Lake Camp for the summer and dropped her off for the week, said goodbye. And about half an hour later, Stephanie's in her car and her cell phone rings and it's her child. And her child says, Mom, I forgot my swimsuit. Can you get me one? Okay, what do you think she should do? What should Stephanie do? Wow. She should tell her. She should probably pick a good pair of shorts. Always want to know. Swim in her shirts. Okay, oh, maybe borrow. Uh, she's nine. Oh, I get her one. Borrow from a friend. I get her one. I get her one. Oh, I'm I am so sorry get that you forgot your swimsuit. You'll have to figure out what you're going to wear to swim. But it's only half, half an hour. She's 13. I don't know. It's only half an hour. She's nine. Nine. Yeah, nine. yeah. we could have lost uh -huh. If, it, if she was already home and it was like several hours away, I'd be like, I'm not coming back. Uh -huh. But if it was only half an hour, but see, that's my problem. I'm here because I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is it a history of doing it? Right. Or is this the first time? I mean, it's tough as a parent to give, have that mercy uh -huh. that you want, yeah. but yet. You know, is this the first time she's packing, or is she a seasoned packer and is used to doing this all the time? Right, right. Because so I would have helped her different pack. factors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what what if you reminded her that you put your swimsuit in the suitcase? Right. I would have checked her bag. And you yeah. kind of transferred her bags. Okay. 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 All right. So here's how we could use the five finger problem solving method. Okay. So the five finger problem solving method is the thumb is what's the problem? Okay. So in this case, child forgot her swimsuit and she's at camp for a week. Right? She could be swimming every day. All right? So we just started doing some brainstorming, didn't we? So these three middle fingers are possible solutions. So I heard drive, you know, go find your swimsuit, drive it back. I heard uh, look in the lost and found, basically, see if there's one there. Ask a friend. You know, ask around, are there any extra swimsuits, right? So we just come up with three ideas. Any other final? Thoughts on how we could solve this problem. Well, someone said swim in their shorts, right? Okay, so there's another option. I would have said two with lunch in. Uh huh. Okay, so swim in your shorts for the week. Okay. All right. Pinky is okay. What's this? Which one are you gonna pick? Okay. Now, here's what Stephanie did. She said, okay, in her head, I'm 30 minutes away. I will get her a swimsuit. However. I'm going to charge her for my time, okay? So it came to a little more than an hour, right? And I'm gonna charge her for the mileage. So when she got home then, this was deducted from her you know, allowance, okay? Now, when Stephanie shared this with Hera in my book in the chapter, Are You Accidentally Raising a Wimp? Hera said, mm -mm, don't do that. She said, you like what Stephanie came up with because it was logical consequences and such. But she said, I would have let her, you know, she had a list, she was supposed to check it off, she didn't, it was her responsibility, and so she should find a solution. I know, hardcore, huh? Yeah. But you have options. And the point is, instead of us just automatically saying, you know, okay, oh, okay fine, I'll, I'll go to Target, I'll find something, I'll bring it up, we need to teach the child to be a good problem solver, right? What solutions do you have, honey? Right? Let's see what you can come up with. Right? Because then we're not rescuing them, we're teaching them a skill that is a life set, a life skill they can have forever. Right? And if you do this, if you do problem solving and teach your child this, maybe you even do it twice a week. Right? So that's over 500 times a year you've been pro helping them learn how to solve problems. 1,500 or more by the time they go to college, guess what? They're less likely to crumble, aren't they? And even kids as young as three can do this. You can help them through, but they always have their five finger problem solving method. Yeah. I was just going to say that this sounds a lot like the theory of love and logic, parenting with love and logic. Yeah. Stephanie, my friend who did the gas thing, she loves love and logic. Yeah. Okay. Another thing we could do. So, as I mentioned, many parents are inconsistent. And here's what I mean by that let's say that um, Johnny hit Sally on Monday. And so I give Johnny a time out. Tuesday, I'm just too tired. I have this long day at work. I don't really care. Whatever. You know, Sally's not bleeding. Out. She's fine. Okay. <laughs> and so, same people, same crime, same everything, but a different outcome. Right? 
Okay, let's say Johnny hits Sally, and I've had it to hear. You know, this is the fifth time this week this kid has done this, and I say, you're grounded for a week. You know, you don't get your iPod, you don't get your iPad, you don't blah, 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 you know. Well, Tuesday rolls around, and maybe it was more of a punishment for me, or, you know, I kind of spoke out of anger, and, okay, fine, you can have your iPad or pod back, right? So, same people, same crime, but I don't follow through with what I say I'm going to do. All right, Johnny hit Sally, and Dad does it differently than Mom. Okay, same people, same crime, same everything, but again, a different outcome. So, anybody ever guilty of being inconsistent? <laughs> yes, we all are sometimes, okay. But, um, it really, again, if you just make one change, but I hope you love five finger problem solving, as a result of coming to this class, really do change that because that's one of the most critical things you can do is to be consistent as a parent with your top rules. Okay, so one of the things I do uh, when I work with parents is have them develop family rules and consequences. So you pick your top three or four and you come up with a plan. Remember, I talked about a strategic plan, right? Okay, so what do we want the rules to be in our family? Maybe it's have your kids listen to you the first time, okay? I do have a, a special program about that if you're interested, but that covers a lot of ground, right? Another rule could be, of course, no, no hitting, biting, kicking, you know, shoving, any of that kind of physical stuff, right? And how you're gonna respond. <coughs> Maybe you wanna have one, we only use kind words. Maybe there's some name calling, put downs, things like that in your family, and you, know, you wanna have this be a emotionally healthy place to, to grow up to. Maybe it's about chores. Maybe it's about reducing back talk. You know, you get to pick what those rules are, but I would pick the top three or four. And then uh, it's a great exercise because it gets, you know, you and your spouse, if you're married on the same page, you and the kids on the same page. But um, I highly recommend that. Okay. Now, um, as we mentioned, a lot of kids these days, and therefore parents, are in a lot of different activities and really over schedule. And so, yeah. Can you just yeah. about the rules? Yeah. What about the fact that um, the kids come to you and say, well, but he started it and she, well, but she, she, I hit her, but only because she, you know, um, took my toy and, and you know, okay. snatched it away from me or whatever. And so the other person's also at fault? Yes. You know what I mean? Like there's a rule, no hitting, but. Right. Right. They sort of. Instigated, right. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. So what you can do is, is separate them, okay, and you can call a timeout if you want to, but you separate the kids and ask each kid their version of the story, right? And so you'll find out more or less what happened and um, what you can do. I have a whole process for timeout we won't go into, but what you can do then is, it, bottom line, if it was a sharing issue, right, that started this, you can get out your five finger problem solving. Okay, so we have a sharing <coughs> issue. Two kids wanted the same toy at the same time. Kids, how can we solve this problem? Right? Here, let's come up with some ideas. Boom. Okay, which one are you going to pick? You know, we'll get two of the toy. We'll set a timer. We'll flip a coin who uses it first. The toy gets a timeout, right? And so, again, if you can teach them how to solve that problem, Okay, it's going to be less likely to happen next time. You go, okay, what do we decide we're going to do? Oh, yeah, that's right. We're going to flip a coin. Let's get that coin out. Okay? And if, again, if you do that enough time, teach them how to be good enough problem solvers, they start to do that on their own, too. Okay? But do you follow through with the consequence of hitting? If that's yes, one of your I do. Even if the other person... I do. You do not have to hit ever, ever in your life. You do not have to hit. You can still deal with the first kid about the sharing issue. So don't get me wrong. They don't you know, get off the hook completely. But no matter how mad you are, you never hit anybody in our house. Never. Boom. That's it. Okay? Okay. So anyway, the barometer that I like to use for reducing stress is, are you stressed as a parent? Carrying all this out? Because your stress is conveyed to the child and the child conveys their stress back to you and it's just this vicious cycle. You are in charge of your kid's time, budget, your time, everything. Okay? And so you get to make decisions. Like for instance, when our, our youngest was five, she wanted to play soccer. <clears throat> in Shoreview, where I live, a kid's soccer was uh, two practices a week and then a game on Saturday for a five-year-old. 
Well, in our neighboring community of Baptist Heights, there was one practice, it was on a Saturday, and then a little game followed. And so we thought, oh, well, for a five-year-old, that fits our family and our values, okay? So we're going to sign up in Baptist Heights. So my point is just shop around, make decisions based upon your own personal values, your own stress level, your own child's passion and interests, and really try to fight that tidal wave of doing way too much for your kids and just being run ragged as a result of it. Because you know what? The number one protective factor in keeping your kids emotionally healthy is time spent with you. Number one protective factor. And trust me, they should be involved, they should have fun and activities and passions and learn those things, but time with us is the most important. And so if that's lacking, you really try to change that equation. Okay? Okay. I'll take a quick question if there's one on, on this topic. Anything you need to uh, form up for? Good? Okay. And I'll stay at the end for questions, too. Okay. Overuse of electronics. Wait till you hear this. Okay. So kids between the ages of 8 and 18 spend more than 44 hours a week, like our full work week, right? Six and a half hours a day on average in front of an electronic device. <clears throat> now, is that just for recreational purposes or any device? That was recreational uses. And that doesn't even include, because, you know, so many students now are using it for school, too. Right. Like our senior, just they gave them laptops. Yeah, everything is done on a laptop now. Yeah, yeah. This was this is just recreational use, okay, and it does include you know all the various gadgets that are there. Okay. Now, <clears throat> here's some of the problems with that. Childhood obesity. Why parents? Yeah, they're sitting on their butts doing most of them, right? Exactly. <clears throat> Culture of disrespect. <clears throat> Anybody watched a primetime family show lately or a Disney show, right? How are parents portrayed? They're barely in the show. Yeah, they're barely <laughs> in the show. Absolutely. And if they are, how are they portrayed? Yeah. Exactly. Stupid. Idiots. Exactly. And all this cutty, snarky comments, right? Okay. Well, guess what? Our child is integrating all of that, aren't they? Are there any primetime shows that you recommend? Show a good example? Does anybody come? My, my, my mind is blank. Does anybody have any uh, that come to mind? No. 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 <laughs> I have several yes. friends that have turned their TV off, unplugged it, and put it in the garage. That's how they sell it. My I kids grew up, uh, our kids grew up with that public television was all yeah. we let them watch until they were, oh, I don't know at least in school, um, but it, it turned out to be kind of extreme because they had never seen violence. And we took them to um, Finding Nemo, oh, yeah. right? And, and the mom dies, my kids were bawling. We had to leave the theater. Mom, mom died. Oh, they had never seen anything like that before. So I think we kind of did them a disservice, you know. Because I have that same issue with, like, yeah. we also don't allow yeah. anything besides, like, PBS shows. Yeah. And st my child is five, and she still cannot even watch a Disney movie because they're too violent for her. My, it could is be that, no. I mean, but I don't personally see a problem with that. No. You don't have to, like, no. Yeah. No, it's far better than the other than stream, the which we'll talk about brain. here. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. What comes along with this? Advertising, you guys. Your kids are seeing over one million ads a year. And guess what those messages are, right? It has to be fun. It has to be easy. Everything's easy, right? Now. Why now? Right? That immediacy. And you're, you're not anything unless you have the latest gadget. So it, it really plummets their self-worth. I mean, there's research about when girls look at those teen girl magazines, you know, it, they'll do, measure their self-esteem before they look at the magazine, and they'll measure it after. And you see a dive. That's just a magazine, right? So we need to teach our A, cut off the exposure to a lot of these, right? But we also need to educate them about ads and what exactly they are teaching. You know, what, what's this message? What are they really selling here? You know? Yeah. Have you guys seen those gay flag commercials? The guy goes, if you want to be awesome, do this. 
if you don't want to be awesome, do this. And like, so if you want to be awesome, get game play. And I was like, we got to get game play. My eight-year-old was like, yeah. yeah, we're not getting game play. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. need it, Mom. We yes. are not. Loss of sleep, okay, kids are getting at least an hour less sleep than we did because they're watching so much TV media, numbing to violence. It, it, it is not like if you see somebody, a kid sees somebody shoot somebody, they're going to shoot somebody, but a numbing to violence. So kids, by the time they're 18, will have seen one thousand, over a hundred thousand violent acts, you guys, and sixteen thousand murders. Wow. You know, I didn't even think about this until I was watching television with my mom, and and she is reacting to things that I'm like, seriously, mm -hmm. like it's mm -hmm. nothing. She's like, come on, come on. Yes. Oh. And I was like, yes, big deal. Yeah, really, yes. like big yes. deal. And I was like, yes. oh my gosh, I'm numb. <laughs> I'm numb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 And she was reacting in a way that actually kind of intrigued me. I was like, wow, this bothers you. Yeah. Or sexual. Oh. Too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For God's sake, don't let them watch the news. Uh, yeah, that's, I never did. For years and years. Uh, but, now this is not in my book. This is the latest research, you guys. I went to a seminar this summer. Electronics are changing the structure of our kids' brain. Okay? And the part of the brain that is shrinking is a part that uh, ties in with empathy and the ability to read social cues. To look at somebody's face, to look at somebody's body language and go, oh, they look disappointed or sad or frustrated or whatever they are. And why do you think that is? Yeah. They're looking at a gadget. They're not looking at people's faces and body language anymore. And so Columbia has actually developed a training program, you guys, to teach people how to do this. As long as we've been human beings, we've been learning how to interpret this information. Now, because our kids are glued to electronics, they're not learning that intuitively. They have to be taught by videos or something, right? <laughs> Here's 168 different kind of, you know, feelings. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then so, imagination, too. Oh, like they can't come no. up with their own idea of what no. to play or whatever. It's all laid out for them. Absolutely. So, you know, these things didn't get you. I mean, this summer when I learned this, boom, we set limits on electronics because that to me was really terrifying. Well, that's that's really the critical thing because the, the number one, I don't care how smart you are, the number one thing that's going to control where you go in life and where you go in your career is people's skills. Yeah, right, right. That emotional intelligence, absolutely. Higher than IQ in terms of success in the workforce. It has nothing. You're which, absolutely which is, right. Is, at the end of the day, it's way more important than how smart you are. It is. And you are absolutely right on with that. Yeah. So here's some solutions, right? Okay, so one idea, uh, and I had Mike Mann from the National Institute of Media and the family in, in my book. Here's an idea that he used with his kids, a coupon system. So you can say, okay, for every hour that you walk in nature, that you exercise, that you do homework, that you read, you know, it's up to you, whatever, however you want to frame this, right? Then you will earn X amount of media time. So go outside, go play, go use your imagination. Maybe it's they do crafts, maybe they just do free play, however you want to set this up. But other things that really help your child's brain develop, right, and relax, and you, they can trade that in essence. So maybe it's two hours of fun and playtime and homework or however we want to do it for maybe half an hour of media use a day. That's one way to do it. And you can have, um, this summer I started a little clipboard. Oh my God, my daughter hated it when my 13 year old, she would see that clipboard come out, it was like, ah! <laughs> and, uh, so it had just had a sign-in sheet, okay? Whenever the child was going to start a gadget, okay, sign in. What time is it? What are you doing? When will you be done? You set a timer. So 30 minutes go off. You know, have they shut down the iPad if that's, in fact, what they've chosen to do? Okay. She was like, no other parents are doing this. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you're right. But I'm teaching others, aren't I? So. <laughs> okay, so that's one way of doing it. You can also think, all right, maybe I'll create some media-free zones in our home. So, maybe during your family dinner you have a rule, all gadgets have to be checked in on the kitchen counter over here. Nobody, you know, even listens to a, a beep on their phone or anything, okay? 
maybe it's certainly it's during homework time. Now those kids who have to use computers and stuff, they have to use computers, but maybe their, their cell phone or other gadgets are, again, checked in. Maybe it's during family time. You know, you guys are maybe going to an apple orchard or something, and so you say, mm -mm, everybody puts their gadgets away. Eating out, sleep time, you definitely want to protect sleep time. Um, I've had families say, okay, you know what? Monday through Thursday, none. Okay, other than for homework use, that's it. On the weekend, you can have a couple hours a day or something, but Monday through Thursday, homework's a priority, maybe activities are a priority, sleep is a priority, and that's what we're gonna focus our attention on. So those are some, some ideas for setting up kind of structure around when people can and can't use um, their gadgets. And, you know, I'll, I'll share another story here. I had a couple I was working with, um, actually both pediatricians, and, and well, the mom was knew about this research and was very adamant, no, I don't want these things to happen to our boys, and so I want to limit it. Dad was like, you know what? I use it all the time. I don't want to give up mine, you know? I get a text or something from work. He goes, I want to be able to answer that. And, you know, at the breakfast table, I'm checking on my iPad, what are the headlines for the day and stuff, you know? And so he didn't want to. So guess what? what? You know, what kind of messages were the kids getting? Mixed messages, right. And so then they can, what? Overcome, right? For the confusion, so I said, okay, well, let's just sit down then. You guys, you guys have to resolve the issue. Are you going to limit it or not? And if you're limiting it, what is it going to be so that it's crystal clear what it is? And they did. They came to an agreement then on how they were going to handle it. Okay, and they did use the coupon system, and they did have their zones like get breakfast. No way. We're connecting. We're not connecting to our gadgets. Definitely keep TVs out of your child's bedroom uh, for a lot of reasons, mainly in the security. If you not, don't know what they're watching, but secondly, kids who have them in their bedroom watch on average at least another hour a day. Uh, and lose a lot more sleep because, you know, they just have access to it when they want it on demand. And then, those of you, how many of your kids have cell phones already? Yeah. Um, do take them out of the bedroom. Um, especially teenagers, that phone, those texts will still keep coming in, midnight, two, three, you know, from other people, even if your kid isn't doing it right, it disrupts their sleep. And um, dozens of texts can go back and forth. In fact, the average kid, uh, teenager, actually 60 texts a day. And then, you know, I mean, you think they're in school, they're not supposed to be using it then, so you kind of add, when are all these texts coming in? And that's just that they're sending and then they're receiving a follow-up that many um, during that time. Yeah, that's the average. They don't, the phone is not a phone. Never. It's for pictures and texting. Yeah. It's not for phone calls. No. You don't know how to make no. Pardon me? My child doesn't know how to call. Well, call your friend. Well, why no. would you? All on the phone. If you call somebody, you say, I'll be right back. If you text, you just say, BRB. It's, well, uh, yeah. If you are a social nerd, phone. if you yeah. make a phone call. And it's they don't know what they say. No, no, they don't. Not what age do you recommend kids get their own cell phone? Oh, oh. Like, I have no idea when is appropriate or not appropriate to even do that. <laughs> the way that I look at it is, um, when do you need them to have a phone, right. you see. I look at cell phones as a security for a parent. If I'm leaving my kids somewhere and maybe the pickup time is a little ambiguous or you know it's just a safety issue, that's when I would make the decision. Um, the kids, uh, I, I don't have an age that I can tell you because it depends where your kid is out and about. But um, personally, I wouldn't do it before middle school. Um, and you're talking, so our, our child was the last person in eighth grade to get a cell phone. I, I mean, I know they might need some for like emergency, like being able to contact, but you could get just the <coughs> little sure. only phone for that. Yeah. I'm yeah. talking about like when, when is it appropriate for them to have it for their own use, like to text to their friends and that kind of thing. Do I, would, I still would hold off until middle school. There's so much abuse that can occur, yeah. and then you enter into the whole cyberbullying thing and responsibility. And, and I mean, I would never put internet service like on the phone if I was giving it to a younger child either. That's just, you know, right well, with the You start off with their plans, you can Google that are really for starting your children. Like for a younger, but like for their own is, oh, I went with Kijik because it had a whole bunch of parental controls. Okay. And if they lost I it, I could stop it right away if it wasn't a contract. Yeah. So you had to be reliable. Yeah. Is it a phone company? 
So anyway, guys, sure. So anyway, so just about the cell phones, have a central charging station and put it like in your own bedroom would be the perfect place so that they can't go down to the kitchen or living room or whatever uh, to get them. So if you can ensure that your child's getting sleep. Okay? Okay. Now here's what American Academy of Pediatrics recommends if you want kind of a, a number to shoot for here. They say no more than two hours a day for any kid. Uh, and actually, the Star Tribune just ran, ran that as a headline this week, but and none for kids under the age of two, because uh, it interferes with their brain development. Okay. All right. Now, some of you, about half of you, maybe said, "Hey, yeah, we give our kids chores," so that's great. So there was a study, and it followed kids. Thanks for coming and doing that for you. Um, followed kids from the time they were born up until they were in their mid twenties, and it was run in California, and they said, "Okay." Let's try to figure out what's the number one reliable predictor of a child's success growing up. You know, is it um, income level? Is it IQ? Is it two-parent household? You know, what is it? And unbelievably, it was whether or not your child had chores growing up. So, those of you that are doing it, continue, make it deeper. And if you haven't started, don't worry, you can start. But kind of the magic age to start with the most benefit was starting at age three. Okay, just simple chores that they could do. They still want to do with them. Yeah, oh sure, they love doing it because a lot of times they're there with you and, and there's so many benefits that come from it. But here's another one just to kind of jar us into action perhaps. Okay. Kids do about 12% of household chores, you guys, leaving 88% for us. Does that bother anybody? Uh huh. They're perfectly capable. Why are we doing all of this? Many of us, you know, working parents and orchestrating all these things, they won't have the life skills that they need. We're doing them a disservice <coughs> if we do not give them chores, really. So what should it be? Percentage. Because that doesn't surprise me. So. Oh, there are so many things that kids are capable of. There's almost, I mean, I can think of very few things that kids are not capable uh, of doing. Okay, so I'll, I'll go over this. So, so what we want to do is give our kids chores. Okay? And a great place to start is a family meeting and just say, okay, you know what? We live together, we make messes together, we play together, we need to pick up together too. And so what do you think you would like to do? You can have a list of chores available and uh, you know, can be make beds, help with dinner, rake leaves, vacuum, sweep, unload the dishwasher. You know, there are a plethora of chores and so just make a list, right? And you can ask your child, which would you like to do? You know, which would you prefer to do so that we're getting their buy-in and they're picking what they're going to do? Okay. So I did that, and my son, he came back with laundry but only towels. <laughs> and it's like, okay. Well, then you can expand on it. You start with towels, and then you can grow from there. 13 year old wants to do towels. Yeah, okay. But that's a start. It did, it was a start. That's a start, absolutely, <laughs> right? And so you just kind of as a, a rough rule of thumb here, Make sure they're doing something every day, whether that's unloading the dishwasher, feeding the dog, making their bed, picking up their toys, you know, things like that, right? Maybe helping in meal planning, which we'll talk about. But And then you can also have some that are done like on a weekly basis. Okay, maybe it is vacuum, maybe it is sweep the kitchen floor, help with laundry, etc. So start with that family meeting. <clears throat> and here's an idea uh, from my book too. Actually, I think... Stephanie was in there twice, I think. Maybe she just talked about this. But anyway, her, she had this great idea. Her, her kids loved Cinderella, her one daughter especially. She had younger kids. Some of you do. And so uh, they would play Cinderella when it was time to clean up. And so they'd dress in tattered clothes, and she was the wicked stepmother. And they would go about their cleanup. And, you know, if everybody did well and cleaned up, they'd have a, a ball after with some Kool-Aid or something, you know and dress up in different clothes. And for her kids, they were young, they loved it, and it made chores fun, they were play acting. Uh, my girls were older, so we would put on Beach Boys music and sing Barbara Ann or, you know, the little Deuce Coop or something, and the three of us would squish in a bathroom and we'd all clean bathrooms together. My husband wanted no part of that, <laughs> right? That was fine. And then we would inspect each other's work. If I was doing the mirrors, you know, I'd say, did I get everything? Is it smeared or anything? So that then I could look at their counters or floors and everything and go, oops, I saw a little something that they're correcting mom to, which they loved. Mm -hmm. right? But make it fun. What do kids love more than anything? Fun, right? Okay. 
Um, Beth Wise, from my, uh, a guest from my book, she was one of the wise parents that I interviewed. Her goal, she had five kids, she was a single mom, and she wanted to make them independent by the age of 12. If they needed to live on their own, they would have the life skills to know how to do that. So that mom had the end game in mind, didn't she? And then she methodically went about teaching them how to have that skill set. So one of the things she focused a lot of time on was meal planning. So she would ask, um, you know, okay, so we have five kids over here, right? Okay, what's a meal you want to help with this week? They'd help plan that night, and you'd get the next night, etc. So in the beginning, maybe they'd wash the lettuce or put the breadcrumbs on the chicken or something, you know. But eventually then, they came to make a meal all on their own one night a week. Okay? So she involved them, she taught them the skill set so that they would have that skill set of knowing how. And she'd take them shopping with her and, you know, the whole nine yards. Uh, but isn't that a worthy goal? Um, with our kids, um, I took an old can and decorated it and then put mealtime responsibilities on the end of a popsicle stick. So it might say, um, set the table, it might say pour the beverages, wash the fruit, wash the vegetable, etc. And then the girls were each responsible for picking two of those chores for each meal. Okay, so this time it's your, you're setting the table and you're pouring the beverages, you're helping me with fruit and vegetables. Now they're Those of you that have teenagers, maybe haven't started or you know not done as much maybe as you'd like, you can sit down and you just take out a piece of paper, draw a line down the middle, and you say, okay, what benefits do you get from our family? There are probably lots of things, right? And then in the second column, you can ask them, what do you contribute to our family? And guess what? <laughs> it's probably a little uneven. And that tends to be a good exercise to help them kind of recognize, wow. I'm not really kind of pulling my weight around here. And then you can ask, what would you like to do to become involved and start doing that? And they pick. And how can I hold you accountable for doing that? And what will happen if you don't do it? You know, with the older child, you kind of talk through the whole process. Okay. Final question on chores? Okay. Now, we have this little problem here. <laughs> Where kids uh, are, we live in a very child-centered culture. Here's kind of what the end result is ending up. 30% increase in measurable narcissism in incoming college freshmen, where the world revolves around them. They don't have that empathy to step outside themselves and really consider other people. How will this play out for me is how they're evaluating the world. Okay? So. Here's some solutions, and these are my favorite ones, you guys, I love these, okay? So, um, Michelle Borba had a friend who decided she had the end game in mind. One of the key values she wanted was for her kids to be kind. So every day, for the entire time her kids were leaving the house from preschool all the way up to college, she would say to them, do or say two kind things for someone today, and then we'll talk about it at dinner tonight. So she reinforced that value probably, what, thousands of times before her two girls left for, for college. And she had two of the kindest kids possible. It doesn't cost us anything, but if that's a value that you have, we'll start on a daily basis reinforcing that. So it's really ingrained brick by brick, build that value in your child. How about building an attitude of gratitude <laughs> so this is something that uh, I started doing with our teenager. Uh, someone had given me this little uh, rosary they had gotten on a pilgrimage. It had like 11 beads on it. And so at bedtime, what we would do uh, is go around and my teenager would say 11 things, one for each of those little beads, of something she was grateful for that day. <coughs> and I would do the same. And some nights she was really into it and she you know, keep going around and do more than that. But um, not only is it just a great thing to do, but there's research from uh, you of Pennsylvania, Martin Seligman and the positive psychology movement, mm -hmm. that being as, recognizing five things, that was the number Martin used, a day can increase our level of happiness and resiliency. 
So, you know, it could be, you know, you don't have to do it at bedtime if you like the idea. You could do it at mealtime or, or some other, or your child gets home from school, it doesn't matter when. But um, it can really increase their happiness level and get them out of that meaning mode. You know, because some days you just even have a rough day, but gosh darn it, you know, you can say, hey, I'm healthy or I have a home or we had a good meal today. There's always something to be grateful for. Uh, third idea, schedule regular couple time. And uh, why do you think this would be important, you guys? So the parents can be happier. The parents can be happier, absolutely. And it gets yes. So you can model that behavior for your children. Sure. Absolutely. And we're not totally child-centered. Right? Parents have needs too. Relationships need tending to. Marriages need to be strong for our family to get together. And that doesn't happen just automatically, you guys. It takes time and effort. And if we're not modeling that for our kids, and then you couple it with the teenagers, <coughs> where they're not even learning how to you know, read other people, and then we'll have less meaningful relationships, that doesn't bode well for our kids, does it? So we need to keep our own self sane for one thing, but to spend some amount of time on our relationship. So a chapter in my book on that, and it's awesome, uh, two really great guys that I interview. So I'm gonna share a couple ideas, and I'll see your question just till the end in case people need to leave right at 11.30, okay? So here's a couple ideas. Kevin Anderson, a marriage therapist in my book, will ask people, and you know, they always say, I'm so busy, I don't have time for a couple time. So he'll say, do you have 30 seconds? Well, of course, we all have 30 seconds. So one of the things that he recommends is doing a 30-second hug with your significant other and starting the day that way. Another tip, spend one minute, just 60 seconds, looking into that person's eyes uninterrupted. It's really a powerful exercise to do. And he'll run into, he does marriage encounters and stuff, and he'll run into people later and they go, you know what was really powerful? That 30 second hug, we've really started doing that every day. Simple to do. Another idea, average time that couples spend in meaningful conversation in a day, four minutes. Okay, <laughs> otherwise it's all about, we're going here, what's going here, what are you doing, da 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 da. Number one activity that couples do together, what do you think it is? Watch TV, right? We're zoning out, right? An average American couple, you guys, has one date every four months. Is it any wonder we have the highest divorce rate in the Western countries? No, we're not spending any time and effort on our relationship, right? So, an idea. So that four minutes, can you make it 15? Uh, a friend of mine, our coach, Mark uh, Brandenburg, he and his wife set a ritual after dinner, 15 minutes. It's mom and dad, conversation time. You kids go do whatever you're going to do. But this, they set a boundary. This is our time to talk adult stuff. You know, go, go entertain yourselves, right? Fabulous ritual to have. But you can do it anytime. Are you going to hear couples, you know, gosh, we barely see each other because of all the running around. Mm -hmm. Call each other during your lunch break then. You know, it's not as good as face to face, but at least it's quiet time. It's you're connecting. Just try to make it happen whatever way it works for you. You know, a lot of times parents will tell me, I don't have babysitting. It's too expensive to go out. I'm too tired. You know, we are so busy, and I get all of that. And so um, an idea I have is you don't have to go out, you guys. You can have an in-house date. And so if your kids, you know, if you get them to bed by whatever, you know, we've got a wide uh, variance of age here, but if your kids are in bed by eight, even if it's nine, I then spend an hour, a couple times, maybe you brought takeout home for just you two. Maybe you, just, you know, light some candles and you eat your takeout. Maybe you have teens that sleep in. So maybe you guys from seven to eight a.m., you get up and you have your own breakfast, just the two of you. Maybe you do puzzles together. Maybe you build a fire and you just do wine and cheese. Maybe you give massages. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to cost anything. You don't even have to leave the house unless you want to, but you do need to make a commitment to making that happen. And so, you know, like what I mentioned earlier about having a family meeting about chores and stuff, and you can do those on a weekly basis. One thing you can add on your agenda item is couple time. And then put it on the calendar just like you would a dental appointment or anything else that we make sure that we keep. Okay? So, here's our summary. 
family rules is a fabulous exercise to do. Best way I know how to be more consistent in your discipline. Okay. Excuse me, teach your kids that five finger problem solving method. It'll, they'll have their fingers their whole life and can be fabulous problem solvers all on their own and gain so much confidence uh, as a result of that. We're really going to try to rein in that media use if in fact it is a problem. If you have younger kids, you know the information right now. You can set it up that way. Start right from the get-go, right? Be sure to give your kids chores. You're truly doing them a service when you are. And, you know, if you'd like to raise a kind child, reduce that sense of entitlement. Mm -hmm. And there were several ideas for how to do that. Okay. So, thank you. I'll stay for questions. And if anybody you know, wants my book, it's here. It's available. And I thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.